Hello, and welcome to The Course. I'm your host today, Martha, and I'm speaking with Professor Scott Snyder from the Department of Chemistry at University of Chicago. Professor Snyder has a PhD from the Scripps Research Institute, has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, has been the recipient of multiple professional accolades, and is viewed as a leading figure in the chemical education space, and is a co-author of Organic Chemistry, published by John Wiley & Sons, which is used by undergraduates throughout the world. He's here to talk with us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Snyder. Thank you so much, Martha. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Well, so obviously now you have uh, established yourself in this career path, but let's go back to a bit of the origin story. So uh, even in childhood, it seems like you came from a pretty science and math forward family. I'd love to know a little bit about that. Yeah, I think you definitely could say science and math is in my DNA. So my mom was a high school math teacher specializing in teaching calculus. Um, And my father was a professor of biochemistry at the State University of New York in Buffalo. And so I remember just as a kid really enjoying doing math problems, period, and in particular going into my dad's laboratory where he would set up little flasks and some food coloring. And he'd let me just play safely in his lab uh, with whatever it was that I wanted. And then you know, by the time I got to high school and actually took chemistry, I don't know if it was the colors of the reactions or the fact that we did get to use math as well as do science at the same time, but it just kind of clicked. And it was kind of from then on that I was really in love with the subject. Yeah. Do you remember specifically what kinds of experiments you would tinker with in that lab? Uh, I do remember one thing which now we would view as entirely unsafe um, and <laughs> viewed as safe back then. So my dad let me play with liquid mercury. And it was really just kind of cool to carry that and hold that in my hand. I just thought that was really fascinating. I'm not going to let my own kids do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was just some experiences like that. I mean, that was that's really the type of thing I remember. Yeah. And at that time, were you at all seeing chemistry as a potential career path or was it still mostly just something that was, you know, fun to think about and intellectually stimulating? Um, It's probably a little bit more the latter. I think at first, when I went to college, actually, for whatever reason, I thought about being a pre-med student. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't don't quite know why that seemed logical, because I've always been afraid of blood. So it's probably not the best (laughs) choice uh, for that particular career path. Um, But definitely, I thought like, you know, I had interest in law, I had interest in other things based on other activities I'd done as a high school student. I think maybe what solidified my desire to go specifically to chemistry was two things. I had had the chance actually to do research. Um, as a high school student, it was more on the biochemistry side, but I think that just got me excited that that maybe is the type of career that I wanted to do. And then mm-hmm. the second, which is kind of an odd experience, I actually went to a summer camp for chemistry. So I was fortunate enough to to do pretty well on a national exam. And so I got to go to the United States um, Chemistry Olympiad Study Camp which was held at the Air Force Academy. And so there was kind of actually the first time I got any training specifically in what I do now, which is organic chemistry. And so I think just being around some like-minded um, fellow undergrad, fellow high school students who really enjoyed chemistry um, really kind of just started to send me on that path. Yeah. What, what kinds of things were you doing at that camp? So it's it's kind of weird because it's not the type of chemistry that you would normally do like elsewhere. So I mean, like, you know, you do titrations and things in high school chemistry labs. There it's like, how can you do the fastest titration with the most accuracy? So it's kind of like an Olympic speed race hmm. to do chemistry, plus, you know, knowledge based questions and things. You know, so it was, it's lots of different things just from technical labs, just like classroom, you know, things, but really kind of pushing beyond the boundaries of what you would typically do in a high school setting. Kind of as a weird irony, this camp became the basis for my first discussion with my wife. So I actually met my wife the very first day of college. And it turns out one of the other campers, the only other camper from the state of New York, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, um, happened to be in her homeroom. And so that was the the basis of the first discussion. Wow. And where, where did you go to undergrad? Yeah, so I was an undergraduate at Williams College, which is a small liberal arts school in Western Massachusetts. It was a great place to go just both to learn. And, you know, in terms of research, there pretty much it was one or two students at most with most of the faculty. And so you got really, really strong attention. And so I took organic chemistry there as a first year and absolutely, you know, immediately just fell in love with the subject. And that's when I kind of realized like pre-med was not the path for me. And Mm -hmm. so far as my friends in the class who were pre-med didn't seem to be enjoying the subject, I really was. And so, you know, kind of from there, just that that became it. That's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And what what is it or what was it at that time about organic chemistry that made you fall in love with it? 
So I think if you've ever like seen, you know, molecular structures drawn out as a professional chemist would draw them, they're very artistic. Mm -hmm. So I think there was just something inherent about like the three dimensionality of things and holding things that to me made it feel artistic. And so that kind of reflected that part of things. I like the idea of being able to take, you know, some starting material A and then making something B. And then in particular, the idea that I could make something either that didn't exist or had never been mm. made before. I thought that was kind of really, really cool. And, and maybe it's just at a weird level, just like how organic chemistry works always kind of at some level made sense to me. And so, you know, it just seemed like it was fun. It never seemed like work to me overall. Yeah. And so in that undergrad time, you're falling in love with organic chemistry. It, it seems pretty clear this is, you know, this is the way you're going to go. Uh, were there any, you know, mentors or, you know, professors at that stage that were really helping you shape an idea of what you could possibly do with it? Yeah, I just had fantastic instructors, you know, both in high school and in college. And I think that that was kind of a key factor behind why it is I did what I ended up doing in part. And maybe as a side story, I unfortunately did not have the world's best economics professor or teacher, excuse me, in high school. And it wasn't until my senior year as a consequence of that, that I then took economics again, and I actually loved it. So, you know, maybe it it all shows, I mean, just little influences at different points in time can send you different directions. Mm -hmm. But I think what was really awesome about those instructors was, again, they just made the subjects fun. And so it's something that I kind of reflect in my own teaching now is, you know, yes, there's a need to impart knowledge and a need to impart critical thinking skills. But, you know, there's a lot of fun that can be had if you kind of understand how organic chemistry works. Yeah, cool. So, all right. So after you graduated from undergrad, uh, yeah, where did the path take you from there? Yeah. So, you know, I had um, a whole array of other research experiences at an undergraduate, um, including working in a pharmaceutical company over one summer, working in a couple of different labs as an undergraduate. And so I decided to attend the Scripps Research Institute for graduate school. And that's a place that maybe many of you have not necessarily heard of. It's the world's largest private um, nonprofit research institute in the world. So it's located oh, wow. in California. So it's a beautiful place to be. And I went there because they just have an incredibly strong program, particularly in organic chemistry, and then also in the allied area of chemical biology, which might be like how people would explore um, how a molecule, for instance, might actually behave if it was in a biochemical system, meaning could this be like a new treatment for cancer or or a new antibiotic, for instance. And so I went went to work with a guy named Casey Nicolau, who was a a world leader um, in that field. And so my specialty is what's called natural products synthesis. And so what this means is we are making molecules that come from nature. They might come from bacteria, from tree bark, from a leaf, from some sea organism like a sponge, for instance. And Mm -hmm. so these are molecules that have both really cool structures. And so what that's going to do is test our ability in a laboratory setting to make them. Um, But what they also have are very important biochemical properties. And so many of these compounds have the potential to be drugs, say to treat cancer or to become a new antibacterial, et cetera. And so it's kind of predicated on the idea that in fact, of the top 20 selling drugs on the market today, over half of them either come from nature or derive from molecules that come from Mm -hmm. nature. So many of our therapies come from that. Very cool. And that, that does not surprise me at all. I keep thinking, you know, I think of, you know, I think modern medicine is amazing, but if you look around, it's like all the stuff we need is really here. We just have to figure out you know, how it works, I think. No, Um, totally. And I mean, a concern for that. So there's a good film. So movies are one of my other passions. I actually watch a movie almost every day, to be honest with you. Oh, wow. Um, But there's a movie called Medicine Man that stars Sean Connery that's kind of about this. And so he goes down into the forest of the Amazon and he's searching um, for treatment for cancer. And, you know, is able to find this in a molecule that, you know, is an ants or something in the area of the Brazilian rainforest where he is. And then at the end of the movie, this area where he's um, working is destroyed by trucks that come through who are trying to develop the Amazon rainforest. And so as species now are going extinct at increasing rates, this is a point of concern. Mm-hmm. We could be just throwing away treatments for disease and we don't even know what they are. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. And it also, as you're describing that, it seems like you actually did feel, uh, figure out like a bloodless way to be adjacent to the medical field. <laughs> no, that's true. I, that's absolutely right. Yeah. So, you know, I said a lot of my collaborations now are with MD, PhDs. So it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's 
So at Scripps, were you able to get your your master's and PhD simultaneously? Was it one of those programs? Uh, Scripps actually had no master's degree, so it was kind of PhD only. So yeah, oh, so after, straight to the PhD. Yeah, so after five years did that. And then I ended up going to Harvard, and I worked for a guy named E.J. Corey. So mm-hmm. he was actually my boss's postdoctoral mentor. He was the recipient of the 1990 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And it was really a, both were really great experiences. Each one of them taught me very different things. So I would say like my PhD advisor, I think gave me a great 10,000 foot view. You know, what's an important problem? What's a broad way to think about it? Mm-hmm. And my postdoc supervisor was very much about how do you fix something? How do you improve something really more granular? And I feel like I needed both aspects, you know, to be successful as an academic and to train other students. That makes sense. And so at, in that uh postdoctoral program, were you starting to work with undergrads for the first time in a not necessarily professorial capacity, but like working with students? Um, There was one additional undergraduate who had been there. I mean, that's true. So as a graduate student, I never really had the chance to teach. Um, As an undergrad, I had TA'd for seven semesters. And so I, I knew, I think, you know, as I was going through the end of my PhD and my postdoc, that I wanted the opportunity minimally to be able to mentor others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought for a time about working in the pharmaceutical industry, but ultimately I felt while those problems are deeply exciting um, and there's no question you would have benefit to human health and have an impact on society, I really wanted to be able to teach more students. And so, you know, when I applied to jobs, I said, if it can be at one of these you know, places where I think I can really, you know, test and evaluate the program I want to run, then I'll go ahead and do it. And so I was fortunate in 2006, I started my academic career at Columbia University as an assistant professor. And what, yeah, what was that like? So, you know, starting to, you know, really teach for the, you know, I guess you would, you would TA an undergrad, but knowing that you wanted to do this, you wanted to mentor, you wanted to teach, and then you actually start doing it. What did, what was the learning curve like there? What did you learn about teaching at Columbia? Yeah. So a lot of different experiences overall. I mean, it just, maybe before teaching, I do remember my very first day as faculty. So I was, you know, coming in, you know, all this equipment had already been ordered, you know, I was coming in from the outside to kind of come and set it up. And so I wasn't dressed very nicely. I was probably wearing my um, t-shirts with holes in it from chemical stains, uh-huh. um, you know, and bad jeans. And so I come in and they're like, oh, well, what group are you in? And I said, oh, I'm part of the Snyder group. And they're like, what group is that? And so and then I explained, you know, who I was, <laughs> what was going on. And it was all good from there. But it was kind of weird when I, you know, got to my faculty office and then closed the door for the first time. And I, I felt alone. Mm. Um, you know, and it, that that was kind of an awe-inspiring, you know, thing that, you know, it's like you're building a city, so to speak, and you may have a plan, right? But it's kind of a brick at a time. And so it's, you know, it was a, it was a fun adventure to do that. Um, as relates to teaching, you know, I remember my very first week there, maybe this was allied to how I was dressed because I was setting things up. Um, a senior colleague, very famous chemist named Ron Breslow, who sadly since passed away, you know, came up to me and he said, this is my paraphrased version of it. Uh, son, you look like you're 12. And so it's really important that you, uh, you know, wear a dress shirt and a tie. Otherwise, students won't take you seriously. And so as a consequence of that, every time I teach, that is my uniform is a dress shirt and tie. It's kind of like my lab coat and gloves and glasses, mm-hmm. you know, for working in the lab. And so, you know, what I did, I, I, I had the pleasure, at least I didn't start teaching undergrads immediately. It wasn't until the, the spring semester that I did so. And so I watched my colleagues teach classes to see what it was like to teach in a huge classroom. I read all of the Rate My Professor comments, which actually was useful because you could kind of learn what students thought was useful and what wasn't. You know, and then off to the races, you know, taught my first large class of 200 students. And at Columbia, it's a really amazing classroom that they have. It's actually featured in a lot of movies. So um, Julia Roberts has taught in there. They've had Malcolm X film was was part of that classroom. So it's, it's, it's really just a cool historic room. Mm-hmm. And like we're in there, like you feel like you just really have to kind of rise to the occasion because it is just like this amazing lecture space. Replete with these huge chalkboards and, you know. Yeah, I don't know if I'm imagining the exact one, but f- there there is sort of that stereotypical, especially si- like science university classroom that I've seen in a bunch of movies. I'm like, I think I am imagining the right thing. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, this big, big tiered room, you know, but and, and everyone looking at you and like, you know, thinking you're the expert, which is scary. I mean, the other way that I try to think about it or keep myself honest mm-hmm. you know, even now is to say to myself, probably each student is, you know, paying the university roughly $100 for my class. You know, so is my class actually worth twenty thousand dollars? 
Mm-hmm. I, I don't think so, <laughs> you know, but, but right. But it's something at least to aspire to, right. To be honest about what it is you're trying to do. Well, yeah. And it seems like, you know, you're also flipping the lens and making sure you are, you know, considering what you're doing through the the vantage point of the student. And- yeah, yeah. I mean, so what I try to, you know, I mean, right. I have to teach certain things and I think, you know, at some places organic chemistry can feel like, you know, I'm teaching you how to read the dictionary. There are a lot of terms, a lot of things. And I think that's not what's exciting about it. And so I try to make sure that whatever it is I teach in any given class, that there's kind of, you know, some reference to how a problem has been solved overall um, within, you know, the general sphere of things, you know. So, I mean, these aren't just reactions or or things that we're learning in a vacuum, right? This might be how table sugar was converted into Splenda, you know, Mm -hmm. Things like that. And then I try to bring in my pop culture references with movies and things like that. Although, sadly, there's very few uh, movies that have organic chemistry within it. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Are, what, what would be one example? Can you well, think of an example of one? Yeah, the, the best The best and my favorite is the movie Good Will Hunting. And so that came out oh, in yeah. 1996, actually the year I was taking organic chemistry as an undergraduate. So, I mean, his, his specialty, he's supposed to be this math wizard. But there's this point in the film where he's dating Skylar, who's a senior at Harvard who somehow already got in the medical school, even though she's taking organic chemistry. But he's apparently really good at organic chemistry. And they have a discussion about it. He helps her with her homework so that she's able to go out and have a coffee with him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, you know, starting to learn, you know, how to keep things interesting to students, how to make them accessible. How does this lead you into the field of of uh, textbook generation? So I, you know, as a graduate student... I had a chance with my mentor in my last year to work on a book with him. And part of that was just due to a couple of factors, one timing. So my main project had finished. And so rather than starting something brand new, that was what I was interested in. And in addition, I think, you know, my writing style kind of matched his and his approach. And so we kind of became a natural team. So I was always interested in it. But how it started for an undergraduate book was frankly just by talking to the sales reps from the different companies that would come by. And as I've kind of come to learn since, most faculty sadly don't tend to talk to the sales reps. Um, Mm -hmm. But just as a consequence of those discussions and just kind of my interest in teaching, you know, I thought maybe this would be a way to have a a bigger influence. And so in around 2011, um, I joined the author team for this book, Organic Chemistry. My co-authors at the time were Graham Solomons and Craig Freely. And it was just, uh, you know, a neat experience to get to be involved in that and to think about in a different way, you know, how does one present material so that others can understand it? Yeah. And I mean, how does one how does one get that job? Were they also at Columbia? Is this something you just sort of apply for like a regular position? Yeah, no. Well, you had I had to apply in a sense. Um, So Graham Solomons was at the University of South Florida and Craig Freely was at Pacific Lutheran University in Seattle. And so, you know, they were the existing author team. And so they kind of interviewed me, you know, just to see whether or not Mm -hmm. there was a match that made sense. Or, you know, I kind of talked about things where I thought I could add to the book and, you know, kind of complement its overall already high level of strength. And, you know, it's become a long relationship since then, which has really been, you know, quite interesting, especially through all the turmoil and changes that have happened both due to COVID and just the public literacy in general. Yeah. What what is is there an example of one of those contributions where you really felt like that you know this is something that I am I am bringing to the table here? Yeah, so if, I mean, I think it it again goes back to kind of my research experience. So I think you know most of the authors of these books and are all are very talented. Many of them teach only and don't have a research component to their program. And so I think what I've been able to do. You know, sometimes these are like little extra boxes that I'm not sure students always necessarily read, you know, or things at the end of a chapter, but might explain like, well, this is how this, you know, led to a COVID vaccine, or this is how chemists were able to design a molecule that could target DNA selectively. So I'm able to kind of bring in some of the newest research and write problems based around research, just due to kind of my familiarity with that aspect of the literature. Mm -hmm. Cool. And again, it seems like those examples are all things, you know, if I imagine there are times where undergrads have had the thought to themselves, why am I learning any of this? Like, what is the point? And it seems like those make very clear allusions to like these grounded ways in which here, you know, like here is what we actually got from that knowledge or that research. Which is yeah, funny. no, absolutely. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, right. I mean, if I teach 200 students, right, there's no world in which all 200 of them are going to become professional organic chemists. Right. right. But, you know, but hopefully if I can teach them to become better problem solvers or better critical thinkers, not a minimum, 
right? Most are going to become voting members of democratic societies, right? At least scientifically informed. And so, yeah. you know, sometimes in classes, I'll give examples of some molecules and I kind of ask them like, well, imagine you were an expert witness in a patent case, you know, what would you say about this? I mean, so these are things that like, if you just look at it, you might have a knee jerk response and be like, oh, well, you know, no, no, we shouldn't approve that or that's bad. You know, but then if you think about it, well, maybe actually it's different. There's a reason why it's different. So, you know, things like that, I, I, I hope um, at least excite students. I know if I was a student, I think that would have, you know, excited me if I had heard those things. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you're doing all this exciting stuff at Columbia. You're teaching. How does your career path uh, lead you to the University of Chicago? Yeah, so I did a way stop in 2013 through 2015 at the Scripps Research Institute. So my alma mater called me back. Um, this time was on, they had a, a Florida campus as well, where they were trying to establish further scientific strengths. So I was there for a couple of years. And then in 2015, Chicago called and asked if I would come here. And so given the strength of the college and all the things that were going on, you know, at this place, all the investment in science period, I thought it was a really exciting opportunity. I've been here um, and I've been here ever since. Nice. It's also nice to have the job come to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Always. You know, no, can't complain about that. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, what what is it like? You said that was 2015 or 2016? Correct. Yeah, 2015. Yeah. So what what has your time at UChicago been like? What have you, you know, in what ways have you grown and learned and um, forged ahead in your own path? So I'd say, you know, there's there's lots of chances for growth. I mean, I think anytime you move, a location. And that's a lot of work. So I almost feel like I have a PhD in logistics to having moved my lab twice. Uh -huh. But it's a chance maybe to rethink problems and rethink about what you want to be focused on, you know, or reassess, you know, is this the most impactful science that I could be doing? I think that's one one area that can have some influence. Um, I've been deeply impressed by the U Chicago undergrads in particular. I remember my very first week here with absolutely no reputation on campus. I had never taught any class. I already had two students who were lining up to do research, both of whom did great work with me and ultimately went on to chemical grad school and already graduated. That tells you how long I've been here. And I remember like my very first class, I got teaching remarks that I had never received before, which was that my classes apparently were too easy. And so you Chicago students actually wanted hard science classes. I'm like, okay. <laughs> we was, can that, was that a surprise to you to receive those comments? A little bit. I don't know if that was representative of the whole, but just to receive it in part, I thought was interesting. I guess what I've been, you know, I've I've really felt students here on the sciences in particular, they want to be challenged and they expect mm -hmm. that challenge. And so, you know, that has not been my experience everywhere. So, Yeah. Very cool. So, you know, now you've been at a, a variety of institutions, you're writing textbooks, you're doing research, you're teaching. Is there anything about either the work itself or the world of academia that you really just could not have known before you, you know, before you walked, walked the walk? Any big surprises? I think for me, it's been a couple of things. I think, you know, the major change versus being a student, and I think you start to experience this a little bit in graduate school, right, is that there's there's not good, quote, stopping points, right? It's not like you take your final exam and you're done. You know, in other words, as my postdoc mentor would say, discovery knows no vacation. You know, so there's mm -hmm. always an opportunity to, to grow. There's always an opportunity to do something. Your inbox is never empty. And so I think it's a little bit about, as a young scientist, I definitely wanted to run a marathon at sprint speed. And you have to learn that that's not going to work and how to slow that down. So I think that's one thing I've definitely learned. Mm -hmm. I think you also don't, always appreciate where a project will go. You can have hope that a project is a good project if you've picked a good problem. But, you know, once it gets into the hands of students, you will be amazed at the new directions that it can go when they take ownership of their projects. And it's been particularly exciting as a mentor just to see how students grow. You know, I think every student, when they come and I meet with them in the beginning and you see their enthusiasm, I have hopes and dreams for what it is that they'll accomplish. And when they go way beyond that, it's just so exciting, you know, to be able to see and to share in that and then to see them, you know, and their achievements in their own professional lives afterwards. So I think when I began, I didn't have that sense of that whole trajectory, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but now that I've been in here 17 years, you know, that's that's good to see. I think, you know, the the sad part that I didn't realize is just how much or how quickly I would be divorced from bench science insofar as like doing it myself. You know, so I have to live vicariously through my students and what they do. That may be why I've taken up cooking as a hobby. So I feel like I can do a little bit of, of chemistry at home. You know, so it's just it's, it's a different feeling. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and that also brings up, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, get in being in the kitchen and things like that. And also, it, I thought it was really notable when you said, you know, discovery knows no vacations. What does that look like in your life in terms of work, like work life balance and making sure you are, you know, engaged with things that you really want to be doing through your work and also outside of it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what it is, I think, for me is trying to keep at a balance things like an office space, like filling out the cover sheet to your TPS reports. Um, you know, all academia has some level of that, right? I mean, there's just work you have to do, you know, just maintain funding, yeah. other things. I'm not saying that that's not unimportant, but it's not exciting, right? right? And so I think it's making sure that just every day there's a certain part that's really devoted to the exciting part. You know, so now I'm a, an administrator on campus. I'm really blessed to have the opportunity to work for the physical sciences division as a deputy dean. And so I make sure every day I, I just literally have to carve out a couple hours in my schedule to make sure I have some time just to focus on science um, and make sure my students are getting a chance to see me. So that really that, that helps. And yeah. I think, you know, but remember, like you can't do science 24 seven, you know, so I mean, even a bike ride or a run, right, it might just be for my physical health, but I just find that so clears your mind. Oftentimes, my better ideas, I think, come after those things. And I'm sure that's true for most other scientists as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's there's that trope, at least in, you know, the arts and all kinds of innovation of like the the shower epiphany. Mm. Right. Of like, oh, I've been thinking about this problem, but it's like, you know, a moment in the shower or like while I'm running that the the answer occurs or the the light bulb goes off. Yeah. Um, but also, yeah, you know, one thing I think is also really useful for people starting out in, in any field, but especially you know, the science is, as not a scientist myself, but one of the things that everybody knows is, you know, it doesn't always work. Mm. So what are some things you've learned through, you know, quote unquote failure, or, you know, through a, a project or a problem that you hope to solve, but it just, you know, it all went awry or went a different way than you thought? What have been the yeah, lessons right. there? I always try. I think I, I feel like probably nine out of 10 of our more important discoveries have come that way. And it's not to say that they're, quote, fully accidental. It's just, in other words, something that we had intended to have happen didn't happen quite as we thought. But what's been key is to know what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Right. So if someone just said, well, the reaction didn't work or something decomposed. That is information, but that's not useful information. You know, so often if we can figure out what it is we've actually made, which is its own detective challenge in of itself, which is also its own separate level of excitement. But if you figure out what you can make, you know, doing something, then it often gives you the clues either to do what it is you want to do mm -hmm. or forces you to then think in a different way about what it is you might want to achieve. And why I think natural products research is good for chemistry and for development is in order for me to declare victory, I have to make sure every atom of that structure is exactly where it has to be. None of them can be missing. And so oftentimes when they're really complex structures, that's really testing the tools that we have. And if I don't have all the tools that I need, if I can't solve it just with um, some scotch tape and a, a hammer, mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to develop that new tool to do the, to do the, the thing. So that's, that's where innovation can come about. Very cool. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, uh, finally, the, the last question is just a really open-ended question, you know, thinking with the, you know, who might be listening to this podcast, what advice uh, would you either give, you know, a younger version of yourself or someone who is just starting out in this field or in the world of academia, potentially looking to become a professor? What advice would you have for someone just starting out? So I would say if you want to do science, period, do not hesitate to start asking for research opportunities. Do this in mm -hmm. high school. Do this as early as a first-year student. Do it even if you haven't taken the subject in which you think you might be interested. You have to start somewhere. And in that spirit, you may not get answers from many of the people you might write to via email, et cetera. That's par for the course, but you know, you just have to get in somewhere. And if you don't like a particular experience, and to be honest, I didn't like my first organic chemistry research experience all that much, um, think about why that was. And in my case, it was, it was more kind of about just the environment than it was the problem or the field. And then my second experience was great. So I think like use each one as a stepping stone or like a chess piece for your next move to try to then make a decision as to what it is that you want to do. For academia, when I started, I, I think the main concern I had was was tenure. You know, will will mm -hmm. I? And the thing is, I I would say on the other side of it now is that's probably the wrong thing to worry about. Meaning, you know, you're going to be given funds, you're going to given an opportunity to explore your ideas, and so all you can do at the end is try your best. 
you know, and if you're excited and passionate about things, I think in general, good things will happen. So don't let that be a deterrent. Um, if that's something you're truly interested in, there's so many examples of people who've left academia to do other things that have been deeply successful and vice versa. You know, so it's not a, you know, I don't like to think that my career is over now in the sense of like, this is what I'm going to necessarily do until I'm 95. Should mm -hmm. I be fortunate to live this long, right? But, you know, there's other opportunities to do things. And I have been amazed at how many other things outside of just teaching and research, but science-based I've had a chance to do through consulting and other things in this role. And that's been really exciting too. Uh, well, I think that is excellent and very well-rounded advice. Uh, and so, yes, thank you, Professor Scott Snyder, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this podcast episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more and thanks for listening.